so Susan Neal from the Peterborough Museum and Archives, uh, who was involved in, who was the project lead in the museum renewal program, uh, the storage renewal program there at, uh, in Peterborough. And so she's going to be speaking about uh, this uh, project that she was involved in. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Simon. Thank you. So how am I doing here? How's that? Is that okay? Good. Well, welcome to managing a capital storage upgrade project, pitfalls, successes, and lessons learned. The Peterborough Museum and Archives is a municipally owned and operated community facility. It was purpose built in 1967. 10,400 square feet, over two levels. The main floor is visitor services, exhibition galleries, and offices. And the lower floor, the archives, collection storage, support space, such as washrooms, mechanical, electrical, shipping, and receiving. In 2003, the museum team initiated the road to change. We completed a feasibility study, a functional program, a risk assessment, and in 2008, we completed a design development project. And I have copies of those documents here if you're interested afterwards. However, along that road, in July 2007, City Council determined that 21 million all in was beyond the resources of the community. So we asked ourselves, you know, why, why not? Was the museum not valued? Was it simply timing? And what next? So the interim solutions included the installation of three modular buildings. We prefer that to portables or trailers <laughs> over the course of a few years. And the repair of the existing building, a new roof, some landscaping, some window issues. Most of the repairs have been deferred given that an expansion was, quote, on the horizon. So the main challenge during this period was to transform major disappointment into positive messaging. So the team regrouped. The public message became being worthy rather than being needy. Need is such a loaded word. People need food, they need homes, and worthiness encouraged donations and support of artifacts, of archival material, and of dollars. So we successfully applied to the Canadian Arts and Heritage Sustainability Program and completed a marketing initiative for the Bosley Collection of Roy Studio Images, and we completed the Peterborough Centennial Museum and Archives branded project. So by 2008, we had a new name and a new logo. Now the Peterborough Museum and Archives required the community's confidence to move forward. And one step to inspiring confidence was a new brand. A second step was to update the public face of the facility. So we successfully applied for Canada Cultural Spaces funding for a public spaces renovation, which included only the main floor, the entryway, the lobby, the galleries, and the stairwell. And we changed the lighting, the layout, accessibility, functionality, and the aesthetic. I think it's important to note, too, that we stayed open the entire time, so throughout the four months of construction. And patrons were excited to see that. They wanted to see the change, it created buzz, and some talking points for our visitor services. So the facility looked better and the community responded positively. Evidence was that our walk-in visitors increased by 40% and the museum's been voted the community's best museum, Reader Select Award winner, Diamond Category ever since. <laughs> so now what? If the building expansion project does not proceed in the immediate future, consider renting or otherwise obtaining off-site storage space to relieve oh, sorry, the overcrowding by moving out the least vulnerable portion of the collections. And this is a quote from the 2004 feasibility study. So what would a cost-effective alternative to a building expansion project look like? The museum team was charged with developing an alternative that would be palatable to the Museum and Archives Advisory Committee, to City Council, to taxpayers, to Fleming College, to volunteers, to patrons and users, users, and of course to funders. So our road to change plan B. This was a 10 to 15 year solution. We would renovate the lower level and lease an offsite collection storage space. In January 2012, City Council approved the path forward in principle. CCI visited and completed a site report. Canada Cultural Spaces funding application was submitted, and city staff 
developed and issued an RFP for a rental facility. However, in December 2012, Council did not approve the award of the RFP. The successful proponent space was outside of the city limits, and Council was reconsidering the model of renting versus owning. So plan C. <laughs> Staff had two weeks turnaround time in December of 2012 to present an alternative approach to Council, and that report had to include a rationale, a price, and a schedule. The recommendation we put forward was to build a new storage facility on site because the museum has four acres within a 14-acre park, and it was approved. Happy Christmas. The external process ahead was dictated by the city's purchasing bylaw, RFIs, RFQs, RFPs, etc. And I have copies of these documents here if you're interested, and wow, that's a lot of paperwork. So the project schedule, it was to be a phased approach. We'd build a new storage facility, move the artifact collection in, and then in phase two, move the archives out, store it off-site, renovate the lower level, and bring the archives back. Sounded very straightforward. And funding was secured from Canada Cultural Spaces, the Museum Assistance Program, from the City of Peterborough Access Fund, from the Peterborough Utilities Group Save on Energy Fund, and from Fleming College. So external funding totaled just over $500,000, 506,734. The City of Peterborough committed 2,836,966, exactly. <laughs> so the total budget was $3,343,700. The museum team managed the communication plan, the PSAs, the media, website advocacy, and this ensured a consistent message and look for what we called the museum renewal project. We couldn't call it the expansion project anymore. It had to be something new. And I have samples of those things also if you're interested. Uh-oh. <laughs> so in any project, no matter the scale, there's two opportunities for flexibility. One is budget and the second is time. The tender submissions came in significantly over budget by at least half a million dollars. Time was the only give. So the tender was reissued. We reduced the footprint, we simplified the mechanical systems, we modified the construction materials, and we revised the schedule. The perception was that the contractor would save money by being on site for a shorter period of time. So it was no longer a phased approach. There was also an internal process going on throughout all this. And the levels of accountability were a challenge. Fortunately, consultation with the public, with patrons, funders, staff, and more had been completed long before the project commenced. And once the project starts, decisions have to be made within hours, sometimes minutes, and if you're lucky, days. So be prepared with compromises, what can be let go, what trade-offs can be made, except being the fall guy, and that will shift around the table, depending on the issue. Bring snacks, really helps, <laughs> and always be on duty. <laughs> it's also important to remember throughout this that everyone else around the table is there because of you, so be grateful and be appreciative. It's likely just another project for them. The added layer was also maintaining business as usual with regular ongoing operations. So the guiding principle, principles sorry, for the collection relocation component of this project was one that our collections are proofed. They've been around a long time and in much more adverse conditions than where they were currently. And secondly, CCI's agents of deterioration. And the number one risk was the physical forces. So here's, here's real time. So the actual schedule. In the fall of 2013, construction commenced outside. In January and February, the collection was packed and moved off site. In February, construction and renovations resumed. In September, construction and renovations were complete. By the end of October, all the shelving was installed, and by December 19th exactly, the collection was returned. I'll remember that day forever, I think. <laughs> 
So the architect team and the museum team worked together to create what we called a map. And it was a draft shelving layout that was critical. It served as the foundation for the collection return, planning the space required, assigning labels to shelves and shelving units, and identifying the locations for artifacts and boxes as they come back. I've brought the actual dog-eared map right here. It should be in our archives, I think. So photo document every shelf before it goes and before it's packed and label every object and box with its future location. In our case, the building, the room and the shelf if you can. Avoid applying the labels directly to the objects <laughs> and uh, they do come off with water. I've also brought a few to experiment with if you want to take any with you. And identify and isolate significant objects that you want to store locally or on site such as sacred objects that need to be kept nearby. And plan for the legal requirements of moving and storing firearms, if you have any in your collection. We kept those on site as well. You will need swing space, and you will need an extra dumpster. Very large. <laughs> so this move equated to triage. It wasn't one where we had years of lead up time. We had three months to prepare to move the entire collection. We had two weeks where two dedicated, experienced packers wrapped up all the smalls, including our affectionately termed creepy marionettes, of which we have over 100. Uh, packing materials were delivered daily, and we had three weeks for the actual collection move. And in that time period, 45,400 objects were moved off-site, as well as 2,000 linear feet of archival material. The museum had little time to stabilize fragile objects or plan for the next day. Thankfully, the movers sent their A-team, security checks, air ride trucks, and so on. And as staff, be prepared to get dirty for long days, some nights and weekends, and definitely some sore muscles. That's Kim Reed, our curator. I didn't tell her I had this shot in here. <laughs> Also be prepared for very large teams, not just in numbers, but in size and in small spaces. So the movers arrive with tight timelines and it will look terrible throughout. The packing and moving are messy jobs, especially on this scale. The cold weather did have an upside. There was no mud and uh, there were no curious onlookers. Remember that uh, temperature and humidity are number nine and number 10, agents of deterioration, the very bottom of the list. That's for our CCI representatives. <laughs> <laughs> so count and measure all existing units before they are dismantled and count again. And be sure to budget for the cost of reusing storage systems. There's a cost to dismantling, shipping and storing, painting and refurbishing, and reinstalling. And also budget for the disposal of units that are not useful. The city policy is to offer surplus items to other city facilities. Most of the museum's surplus shelving went to the police department's new evidence storage facility. So the collection move was shifted ahead by one month to accommodate a, asbestos remediation. 430 skids plus individual items such as these clock faces and office furniture left the museum in three weeks. So the layout of the storage systems was determined by the functional program from 2005, what we knew of new and pending acquisitions and a plan for growth. The layout also incorporated new and existing units and access, and the schedule included the installation, the inspection, cleaning, lining, and labeling of the units. So while the collections were off-site and construction was underway, there was a window of time to confirm the shelving layout and time to issue and award the RFP. From, from start to finish, an RFP can take over two months. So be mindful of the lead time on shelving units as well. Sometimes production and installation can be up to six weeks or more. And the shelving must be in before the collection can come back. And invest as much as you possibly can in extra shelves, wall racking, hanging clips, and so on. The museum team planned for over 25 years of collection growth. We opted for a large footprint with stationary shelving 
In my experience, a building is a much tougher sell than shelving, and there are funding programs for storage systems, and we could swap out the stationary shelving to compact storage later. So here's some before and after photos. I, I know there's some familiar, familiar faces in the crowd that will remember the before. Um, approximately 5,000 square feet was repurposed. 2,000 became the archives, 1,000 the multi-purpose room, plus there's a lab, a archives reading room, and support space. The archives compact storage units increased capacity by 40%. It's difficult to show the before photos. I know we look a little irresponsible and unprofessional, but I feel I'm amongst friends here. <laughs> now this wooden compact unit on the left was reused in the curatorial center. It was refurbished and the shelves were adjusted to suit acid-free textile boxes. The wooden unit was over 25 years old, so the off-gassing was long past, and the plastic curtains were replaced with panels. Fleming College provided beautiful custom equipment by Space Saver. These are tables with uh, heavy duty casters, adjustable heights, they're washable, durable. So that is literally the same space. And the framed art storage is now in the curatorial center. Note the color changes in the flooring. That is to assist the visually impaired. Apologies for this photo, it was minus 20 with the wind chill on Monday morning <laughs> in Peterborough. <laughs> so the curatorial center is just to the south of the existing facility. It's over 9,000 square feet, and of that, 6,500 square feet are dedicated collection storage. The storage system's layout includes the new shelving and the existing, and the plan was to keep like with like artifacts, and we achieved that for the most part. The watercraft is near the double doors for easy access and removal. Archives records management are in the very far corner because they're seldom used. Framed art, hair wreaths, of which we have 50, I'm sure. Mounted specimens, hat boxes are also near the double doors. Now the team discovered a few discrepancies with the layout during installation, and that's a very polite way of saying that we miscounted the existing units terribly. <laughs> so that's why I say count and recount and recount again. So here's a long view, one looking east and one looking west before the collection arrived. Be sure to have ladders and carts on hand when the collection does return. And the labels are all magnetic, so they're movable, flexible, can be changed as need be. And you can buy that, um, the sheet of metallic paper now just at Staples, right, and print it out and put it on there. And be ready for the movers. Handling artifacts is the number one risk, so best to get the new locations right the first time, especially with large, heavy, and or fragile objects. And as time allows, review the pre-move photos of the shelves so you're prepared for what's still to come. <coughs> These are lovely rolled textile units. Thank you, Space Saver. Great flexibility, scope, and accessibility. The watercraft racking is also amazing. It was a custom product with Space Saver Gusto Metal out of Ottawa and JHG Consulting Network, Network Inc., who's Michael Harrington from CCI. Because the fire suppression system was expensive, there was a suggestion it be deleted for cost savings. However, it was a commitment in the Cultural Spaces grant, thankfully. This pump system is in the shipping receiving bay of the curatorial center. It's a wet sprinkler system for the archives in the main building and the curatorial center storage. When you're putting that in, be aware of the distance required between a sprinkler heads and storage units. That was a bit of a challenge we faced. And pumps such as this all require generators. So that's a cost you must factor in as well. This pump is exceptionally substantial because the museum is on a hill. For every 10 feet of elevation, you lose five pounds of pressure. This photo does not also, um, this photo does not demonstrate ideal health and safety, but it does, <laughs> but it does show the scale. <laughs> That's Shane, yeah. So the curatorial center in use, these are Fleming College Museum Management and Curatorship students. And this facility, 
Throughout the process, I listened, or the team tried our best to listen and consider all of the recommendations that came from the engineers, from the contractors, and from the trades. And I think the facility is better for their advice. For example, the task lighting above these tables, locations of laundry sinks, styles of door sweeps, flooring materials. They bring vast experience and practical solutions to the table. So I like to think the new facilities reflect these characteristics of excellence from the American Alliance of Museums in plain English. Know what stuff you have, know what stuff you need, know where it is, take good care of it, make, someone gets, make sure someone gets some good out of it, especially people you care about and your neighbors. Don't crowd people or things, make it safe to visit your museum or work there, keep it clean, keep the toilet paper stocked, and if all else fails, know where the exit is and make sure it's clearly marked. <laughs> this is a video created by one of the Fleming College Museum Management students. Malcolm also composed and performed the music, so I think you'll get a nice view of the facility. Now how do I click, right? There we go. The relationship between the museum management program at Fleming and the Peterborough Museum and Archives goes back many years. Um, and I think that, uh, certainly in my experience, it's really the backbone of the MMC program. The MMC students are wonderful to work with. Um, you know, they're, they're always ones that stick out in, the, in, in your past from years gone by. And, you know, it's just one of those things like every year is a different year, but every year brings on greater and more challenge. The old facility um, did uh, have many challenges in terms of being a working environment for students. The conditions were overcrowded. Um, it was fairly dark uh, in the, um, the downstairs area of the museum and items were difficult to access. My first impression, can I swear? I think when I first saw the new facility, I was kind of awestruck. It was just so odd. Definitely odd. Oh, I'd say amazement at how organized it is compared to the old one. In all my 30 years, I've, you know, I've dreamt of a facility of that nature. After the initial gasp, I think just an overwhelming feeling of, of happiness and delight. PMA staff are amazing. They're so professional and so helpful. As a student working in a storage facility like this, it's pretty amazing getting to do what the professionals do. Honestly, what we can do in the new facility is see the collection. It was so tightly packed before, um, even objects that I had forgotten about in my 30 years here, I'm able to see uh, they're in such a spectacular, bright facility, all laid out. Everything is just wonderful absolutely amazing. This is a Museum Geek's dream in here. It's just wonderful. I think there are a number of ways that the new facility will improve students' learning. I think it's just a tremendous opportunity for students to see firsthand best practices in collections management and care. I think it just gives them a, a great opportunity to work with these wonderful facilities. Great working conditions in terms of the kinds of collections projects that they undertake. I always trust the staff. They're professionals, and I think that they encourage the students to be professionals as well. To some degree, there, there is a little bit of trepidation, but you have to, you know, go with your gut. You have to understand that they are learning, and that they're probably just as nervous as you are. So. The coolest parts about being able to work in a facility like this is having the opportunity to really be sort of doing hands-on work with materials and the tools. I know a lot of uh, programs might not get that opportunity, so I think that's a really great thing to have.
So there's a very long list of thank yous. It was an extremely large team to complete this in a very short period of time. This time last year, the collection had just left, right, or about a month prior, I guess. So if you're ever facing such a project, I think the best advice comes from the Dead Dog Cafe. Stay calm, be and wait for the signs. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Susan. Um, <laughs> does, uh, are there any questions for Susan about uh, this project? Question from Lana. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, could you have any idea what the cost was to move your collection, store it for that period, and then bring it back again for moving? Let me think about that for a minute. So we had. Initially, the quote was for $100,000 to do the staged, sort of phased approach where the movers would come in, take the collection from one building to another, but then when we had to have them pack it all up, move it to their building, store it for eight months, it turned into nine, and then bring it back, it was increased by close to $40,000. So it was $140,000 to have the movers come and they um, packed it all up, obviously, provided all the supplies, equipment, et cetera, took it to their facility and returned it and staffed that. Uh, that also includes um, dismantling the shelving and storing that as well, including the, um, we had three different components of compact storage, which are tricky <laughs> to take apart and put together. If you've ever seen that, it's a giant puzzle. So. That was what it ended up costing, and we did receive $50,000 from MAP, and I had previously asked for and received a $70,000 capital grant from the city. So together, we were within budget, or very close anyway. Mm -hmm. yeah, you're welcome. Any other questions? Great. Well, thank you very much, Susan. It's a great presentation. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.